Today I play the role of an expert in urban planning. No, jokes aside, let's talk about the mega project to build the new administrative capital of Egypt, announced by President al-Sisi at the International Economic Conference held in Sharm el-Sheikh in March 2015. There are many opinions about it. There are those who consider it necessary to attract foreign investors and realize a sort of Dubai 2.0, and those who instead consider it a waste of money. But let's go step by step. The first attempts to transfer the government center to the middle of the desert date back to the second half of the 1970s. Due to the demographic boom and the rapid growth of the urban agglomeration, President al-Sadat decided to build a new administrative capital named after him in 1978, precisely 59 miles northwest of Cairo. Actually, before him, a similar thing had been done by President Nasser, when, with the enlargement of Heliopolis district, he founded Nasser, which today is a suburb, but according to the initial projects, it should have represented the new Egyptian capital. However, Sadat City managed to grow for a short period, and also hosted some ministries, including that of housing, which remained there for eight months before returning to Cairo after the assassination of al-Sadat himself. The development of the city was totally abandoned during the era of President Mubarak, as its population barely reached 150,000, and most of the buildings that were originally assigned to the ministries were converted to house the newly established Menoifeya University. Finally, in 2014, the government of President al-Sisi dusted off plans for a new capital, making it one of the priority objectives of the development strategy named Egypt 2030, and which today raises several doubts about its sustainability. The strong interest in the project is witnessed by the progress it has made in recent years, and many experts agree that two are the fundamental reasons behind the revival of this ambitious idea. The first is the need to legitimize the presidential government in the eyes of the population, and the second is the intention to move government institutions away from the center of Cairo. Theater of episodes such as the Arab Spring arrest and the coup that led to the fall of President Mohamed Morsi in 2013. But let's talk about the project. After the failure of the negotiations with Kuwait, Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates, and after the lack of Chinese support for some differences on the financial framework adopted, the Egyptian government decided to make the first move on its own by drawing on the national budget through a team of architects and designers united under the name of Urban Development Consortium Plus Five. In reality, Chinese companies have never completely disappeared, but their investments for a declared amount of $1.2 billion are nothing more than limited loans. These funds, in fact, can only be spent on Chinese-sourced equipment, including material for a new metro system that should connect the new capital to Cairo, and for what will be the tallest tower in Africa, partially assigned to the China State Construction Engineering Corporation, while the company in charge of construction and management of the entire city is administrative capital for urban development, whose majority share is in the hands of the Ministry of Housing and the remaining 49% in the hands of the armed forces. Rising from the sands 27 miles east of Cairo towards the Suez Canal, the new capital is the last and largest desert city promoted by the regime. But enterprises of this magnitude aren't unusual in Egypt, and past regimes have always considered them the panacea for all ills. As for example, the Great Aswan Dam was seen as the final solution to the problem of the distribution of the waters of the Nile, so in our case the new capital claims to solve the problems of unemployment, transportation and overpopulation. The promises are many to lighten the load on the real estate market of Greater Cairo, to accommodate the city's growing population, to reduce pollution and traffic congestion. So the government has presented the new capital as a pole of attraction for international investment and the center of economic growth. Thanks to the industrial drawings, we can get an idea of the layout of the future city. An area covering over 270 square miles, 68 of which have been developed in the first phase until 2018, intended to accommodate over 6 million Egyptians. 
It is divided into several sectors. That of the Wadian residential neighborhoods, divided into high, medium and low density zones, which will reflect the future costs of the housing units there, with educational services and social and health infrastructure. The business district, consisting of offices, an industrial area and a solar farm, a solar park that is expected to cover 70% of the city's energy needs, a complex of parks with a serpentine shape that intends to imitate the course of the Nile River for an extension of 9.6 square miles a large airport, then we have the government district, which will host ministries and public offices, and finally the presidential palace. For the way it is structured, it looks like an urbanized part of the agglomeration of Cairo, the so-called Greater Network, which includes several satellite cities. And this is derived from the fact that the mega project will not have its own governorate, but will fall instead under the administrative responsibility of the governorate of Cairo. All this for the modest sum of between 45 and 58 billion dollars. But is everyone in agreement on achieving such a feat? Obviously not. There are different lines of thought. But but let's talk about how the government justifies such an expenditure of human and economic resources. Supporters see in such an ambitious project the birth of a Dubai of the Mediterranean, perfect for attracting national and foreign investments and tourism. Taking Dubai as a point of reference is not wrong, especially if we consider the image that the Emirates metropolis has managed to offer in the last 40 years, with the tallest skyscraper in the world, enormous artificial islands, and the largest airport in the Middle East. And what are the unofficial reasons? Al Sisi wants to use the new capital to strengthen his position, winning over the private business sector and gaining back the popular support that had sustained him during the bloody crackdown on the Muslim Brotherhood movement. In fact, recent events such as the devaluation of the national currency, the pound, the repression of critical voices, the increase in fuel prices and the border clashes with Sudan have left their scars on the legitimacy of the president and his administration. Instead, the 2011 revolution that led to Mubarak's downfall is important in understanding why the move of government institutions is so imminent. It was originally scheduled for 2019 but postponed due to the pandemic. The revolution was primarily urban and gained momentum due to the popular mass concentrated in Cairo, where networks and media allowed civilians to organize and mobilize quickly. This resulted in a huge wave of people emerging from the center, nearby areas, historic parts and even the wealthiest neighborhoods to gather in symbolic places such as Tahrir Square, the cradle of the Arabs League's HQ, the center of Egyptian bureaucracy Mogamma, the Nasser era Nile Hilton Hotel and finally the headquarters building of Mubarak's National Democratic Party. Same procedure was followed during the coup that deposed President Morsi in 2013. Therefore, the current regime is well aware of the iconic power of the square and this explains the aspiration of the authorities to abandon the old and overpopulated Cairo and move to their happy oasis in the middle of the desert, far from the people they have to govern and from their unpredictable movements. If the displacement of the institutions is now confirmed, can we say the same about entire families of ordinary citizens who will be able to live in the new capital once completed? The prices of housing units are prohibitive. Think that a two-bedroom apartment costs about $50,000, a huge sum that is out of reach for many in a country where the GDP per capita is about $3,000. The big risk then, unless the government takes appropriate action, is that the new capital will act as a cage for the rich and do little to meet the needs of poor and disadvantaged residents. This is why the new administrative capital is already seen by many as a colossal waste of resources. Critics say that it would have been better to spend that money on improving living conditions in the poor parts of the old capital, or even better to reduce regional disparities across Egypt by providing services, job opportunities and projects to improve the overall quality of life. In response to these criticisms, the authorities have stated that the city will also include social housing, but didn't provide details on when it will be built and made available to those in need. All of this brings to mind the regime of Hosni Mubarak and his downfall. The last decade of his government was supported by the rise of wealthy capitalist lobbies that helped the economy grow but prevented the benefits of this growth from reaching the poorest sectors of society. And indeed, one of the most prominent slogans in the January 2011 protests that overthrew the Mubarak regime was social justice. Who knows if history will repeat itself? One thing is certain, Al-Sisi's new fortress will make the hypothetical 
uprising just a little more difficult to accomplish. Well, we are done for today. I hope I gave you a clear idea of what will happen soon in this part of North Africa. We will hear about it again in the near future. See you in the next video. Bye.